Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me again today. I am your host, John Naster, but you can call me Johnny. My guest today is a dedicated entrepreneur and an advocate for the poor. From 2013 to 2016, my guest lived with the world's poorest people in Africa, where he built more than 100 houses for the homeless and crowdfunded over $100,000 to build a girls' school. He is now the founder of Donorsy, a marketplace that lets you help the world's poorest people in seconds after downloading the app. And then it proves it with raw video updates. In this conversation, we discuss how Donorsy went from idea to reality in just a few months, the science of scaling a business and doing charity the Silicon Valley way. Now, let's hack Gret Glyer. Email marketing. It can be so damn boring. Or it can be so damn awesome. It can. Email marketing is one of the favorite one of my favorite parts of being like an online entrepreneur. Absolutely. I find it fascinating. I find it intriguing. And I love having that direct contact with subscribers, with fans, with listeners, with readers, whatever it happens to be that I'm doing it at that point. Companies using marketing automation will see 53% higher conversions than those using traditional or what I call boring email marketing. Active campaign will enable you to send perfectly timed messages in response to your customers' actions and behaviors. The best part is it's going to treat your email contacts as unique individuals, which they are, and you cannot forget that, rather than just sending everyone the same boring message over and over. Plus, ActiveCampaign is beautiful and easy to use, even for someone like me. <laughs> There's no need to hire consultants because you can set it up for yourself. See why thousands are upgrading to a more intelligent marketing solution. Sign up right now for a 14-day free trial. Don't even need a credit card. How, how, how much better could that be? Visit activecampaign.com slash hack. There's no training fees, there's no contracts, and pricing is absolutely accessible to anybody. Custom deal for Hack the Entrepreneur listeners right now. Free migration from your other email provider if you are using one. Your second month of service is absolutely free and you're going to get a free one-on-one -on -one strategy session with their platform consultant. Start marketing smarter today. Get and convert more leads with ActiveCampaign. Go to activecampaign.com slash hack and sign up for your 14-day free trial. We are back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur, and today we have a very, very special guest. Gret, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me, John. Absolutely my pleasure. I'm glad we got to find time to sit down and do this. Definitely. I, I think it's going to be fun. Let's uh, jump into it, shall we? Yeah. Gret, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? I think there's, if I, as an entrepreneur, there's the whole process of like starting and ideation, but like once, once you're starting on an on a idea and you're already launched, I'll, I'll take it from there. I would say that the biggest contributor has been finding those, finding the highest ROI possible. Like I like not wasting time on, building things or working on things that are not going to produce a lot of ROI, but like really investing all of my, all of my time and energy into the things that seem like they'll have the highest return. Whoa. I like this. So you're into leveraging basically your time and resources. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, you have to as an entrepreneur. Otherwise, I mean, you're like the entrepreneur is constantly struggling with uh, having enough resources, having enough time. And if you're not leverage, leveraging it, how are you going to compete against the bigger guys? Exactly. Very well said. So your, your latest venture 
is donorcy, which is called the future of charity. So, which obviously from its surface right there, um, that's where you're getting a huge amount of ROI. That's like, you're going for a huge amount of impact. Yes. Is that something that you thought about? Like, even at the point when you said how there's the whole like ideation, that process, and then like executing, did you sort of think about that before even deciding to start DonorC? Yes. I mean, even before starting DonorC, I was always like, what can I, how can I like maximize the amount of resources that I have in front of me? So no, no matter what I've been working on, I've always tried to try to do that. And I think that's one of the things that made it hard. I used to have like a corporate job. I think one of the things that made it hard is I was constantly spending time, like all of the fun stuff, the highly maximized ROI that was already done by the entrepreneurs at my company decades ago. And I was just working on the, like the little gritty, like, let's try and get a, a slightly bigger one, you know, 1% margin in, in this one tiny area, this one tiny department. And that stuff is boring to work on for me. So yeah, I was, I've, I'm always someone who's looking to make the biggest impact. Excellent. I love it. And you're right. It's the, when you have those jobs, that's, you are just working on sort of, I guess, getting that tiny little bit of optimization rather than actually just initial execution. So yeah. can you sort of, Donor C is, it's relatively new. It's just less than a year old. And it, it kind of ties in, at least from my surface sort of view, to Homes, which was your previous venture. So can you kind of tell us how a year ago or whenever it was, where the idea for DonorC came from and then how you decided that you should execute? Sure. The idea for DonorC, I, I spent three years living in a third world country. It's called, it's really small. Most people haven't heard of it. It's called Malawi. It's like, in, it's in the Southeast part of Africa and I spent three years living there in this like third world country, one of the poorest on the planet. And I care a lot about poor people. I want to do something to help them. I, I think that like I unashamedly say, I think that we have a responsibility to do something about it. Just once you start, once you're, once you become aware of the impact that you can make, I like to tell people like, well, think about like what you're capable of doing and, and so forth. So I was living in this country and I was thinking like, I want to help these people. And I was working on the housing ministry, the, the homes that you referenced and what that did was we built houses for orphans and widows. And I could have easily taken that and I could have easily started building, you know, millions of houses around the world and like expanded that out and built headquarters in the States and all that kind of stuff. And that just was not interesting to me because I noticed a problem that was even more fundamentally wrong. And that's the way that the nonprofit sector is set up. The way that the charity sector is set up is it's not designed to be effective and it's not designed to help poor people. It's pretty much just designed to get donors to give you money. And, and then that's it. I mean, like, so you, you give, like, let's say you give money to build a, let's say you give money to a school in Thailand or something. So you like go online, you fill out your credit card information, you send them the money. And then a month later, they don't tell you, this is how we use the money. A month later, they come back and they say, Hey, thanks for that last donation. Can we have more? And that's, this is the constant repetitive cycle that happens with these charities. And, and I'm living on the other side of the world seeing like people aren't even using the money. Well, like there's, there's billions of dollars. I think last year, $370 $370 billion was donated to charity in just the United States. And that money's not being used well. In some cases it is. There's some places where like maybe even stateside it's being used exceptionally well. But once you get internationally and, and there's no eyeballs to check what you're doing, I was noticing there's like this big disconnect. So yeah, so I, I saw that and I was like, this is the thing I want to work on. This is the thing I want to fix. I want this money to be used effectively. So that's why, that's what got me involved in DonorC. Wow, I love it. And was there ever a feeling, I mean, this would go contradictory to sort of your initial one thing, but is there ever a feeling when you come up with an idea for something like DonorC that it's too big to take on? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it started off not as a huge idea. When the first time it popped into my head, I was on the phone with someone and I was living in, literally living in in Africa. And I was, and they asked me like, what, what, you know, Greg, what are some of your dreams? What would you love to do someday? And I said, I would love to start the Uber for charity. And I just said that off the cuff. I don't even know where I came from. So at the time, you know, it was like the Uber for charity is like this nice bite-sized sentence. Who knows what it even means? I just said it. And I got off the phone. Later, I, I went and I typed up a little one-page thing. And then it, was, then it turned into a one-page thing. And then later it turned into a business plan. And then later we got funding and later and so forth and so on. And so when, when I first had the idea, it was a very small thing. And it's actually morphed and developed over time. Wow. I love that. So it literally just kind of I mean, it's the thing right now. It's the Uber for any sort of market you want to enter. So that works. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Because even nine or 10 months after now, it seems like, 
a huge idea because it is you're you're trying to change the world in like the way yeah. charity is donated right but it doesn't have to necessarily start like that is what you're kind of getting at yeah there's a whole there's a whole science to scaling and, and working on things appropriate to the size and the impact that you're making so yeah when when it's when, when it's a new brand new thing I, it was just a seed right it was just like the seed that was planted and now it's starting to grow and blossom and, and it's it's been launched we launched last september and it's turning into this and like you never know how these things are going to go we're very fortunate in that our like we've just taken off almost not quite right after launch but almost right after launch we just have had this like upward trajectory and you never know you know th- these things don't always work out that way in fact most of the time they obviously don't but yeah but i think as it's grown and as like different people have started using it and talking about it like i never like this like the huffington post yesterday released an article in, in a about a month ago the national review did the same thing calling donors see the future of charity and that's just kind of like a name that's stuck right that's just like what people are calling because people a lot of people see this is what donors see say and then this is what it's going to do to charity in the future this is what's going to happen when charities start getting disrupted because they're not offering nearly the, the amount of feedback that donors see is so yeah i think that's uh a lot of it has kind of like developed and morphed over time and and that's how it should be like if, if you try and do everything at once and plan out too much you won't get anywhere how did you get this attention uh, for the like the PR stuff, like from the beginning, yeah. How you say it kind of just took off. Like, I mean, that's everybody's dream for uh-huh. an idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for one thing, it's just like it, it just happens to be like a really good idea. It's just one of those things where you hear about it and you're like, oh, why didn't this exist ten years ago? So, like, I'm, I'm not sure we've even mentioned this to, to your for your listeners, but like, what, this is what we do when you like, let's say there's a little girl in rural the slums of India who's deaf. In a lot of cases, this is like a really bad thing for for these little girls because they're deaf, they can't talk, they're really at risk of being raped. I mean, it's a very bad situation, right? But for but often it takes like 150 bucks to provide that little girl with a hearing aid. So lots of charities kind of say they do that, but you never get to see or hear it. On donors, you give money to a little girl in India, in the slums of India, and you provide her with a hearing aid, 150 bucks, and a few days later you get a video of the hearing aid being fitted on her and her hearing for the first time. That's what we do. We like raw video updates on on the gifts that you give. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so what was I going? With? Oh, yeah. How, how did I get the attention? I mean, so, yeah, I think for one thing, that's just a cool idea, right? You, you tell that story. There's we have we have stories like this happening on the platform every day. And there's like a virality to that. Right. There's a little girl who is saved from a crocodile attack. And then people talk about that. There was a widow who has built a house for like 700 bucks. And she was other. I mean, she was like literally homeless. So like you've got all these little stories happening on the website and we, and we do social media and videos and all that stuff. So some of that helps. So I think having a good idea. And then also we were very fortunate and, and this is very important for your listeners. We found a base very early on. So I think it was a week or two after we, a week or two after we launched, we, I was invited to, to be on the Tom Woods show, which is like a libertarian podcast. And this is like a libertarian's dream in terms of like just going like they're all about like going around the government and like as little government intervention as possible and that kind of thing. So to hear this platform comes along that really speaks to them and resonates with them. And like one or two weeks after we launch, I'm on this pretty big podcast. And that gives us like a base of people who are, who start using our, our app on a regular basis. And then it was built. We had like a really talented tech team. So because it was built well, we were able to capture the users and they were able to equip them as evangelists, as you call it, which basically means help them to share on Facebook and Twitter easily and that kind of thing. And so that that's kind of how we, we got launched. And then different different media outlets have picked us up since then. Wow. I love it. So it's it's not that it was necessarily like a conscious concerted effort. You tried some things like the videos and they work really like when you say like and so they just kind of went viral, which is obvious because it's a good idea, which it's it's obvious because it worked, right? I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah it exactly. is a really good idea. I just was wondering if you like you were like sitting around a table, like scheming these grand ideas and they were working really well, but you just have a really good idea and you have the technology and platform to put it out there and people want right. to talk about it. And it's all, it is all execution, right? You can have the, the idea is very important, but there's also like lots of really good ideas that never get the chance to take off. And I like the, there's a Gary Vanderchuk, who I'm sure your listeners are probably familiar with. He talks about how like you just can't have excuses, right? Whatever it is, if you don't have enough money, if you, like we haven't spent a single dollar on marketing since we launched or even like we've never spent a dollar on marketing. And we've just been fortunate enough to have like word of mouth and like podcasts like yours and PR interviews and that kind of thing. So all that's been been really helpful. But like to your point, one of the things that's been really important is 
we just try a bunch of stuff and we're not spending money on, but we like, try, like we'll try and get on different interviews or different podcasts or just like anything that, that might have the potential to work. We try it and we see what happens. And if it works great, we'll keep pressing into that. If it doesn't work. Okay. Then like, we'll stop wasting time on that. And every, every month or so my team kind of gets together and, and we're like, what are we wasting our time on right now? What is, what are like the list of things that we're doing that make no sense whatsoever? And then we just like, make sure we don't do those time wasters anymore. Wow. What size is the team right now? Our tech team is four people, and then me and another guy named Davis, another guy named Sando are working on. It's it's basically like a marketing team, but it's it's I call it we call it, I call it the user growth team because marketing is like your marketing team is you're spending money, but user growth to me is more important. As user growth is like we're actually like bringing people onto the platform who are actually doing things. Like that's that's the more important metric. So we call it the user growth team. So as as a marketplace, this always sort of sticks in my head where unlike like building a product or a piece of software where you just have to go out and find customers, you kind of have to bring people from both sides of the marketplace to make it work. Right. So how are you, are they, are they to you both like sort of quote unquote customers to use a loose term as in the donors and then also the people who need the donations? And are you actively sort of going out and searching for both? Yeah. So, I mean, we've emphasized different sides of the marketplace depending on which one's more inflated. So there there have been plenty of times when we've had more donors than projects and plenty of times when we've had more projects than donors. And so, yeah, that is like a balance that we're constantly having to, to work on. If if you have listeners who are, who are working on the two-side marketplace, there's a lot of good literature that they can read out there. I would say the thing that they, they one of the things to, to do is like really, you have to figure out who's your main audience. Who's the main, who are the main people that you're going after? Are you Are you trying to provide an experience for the donors or are you trying to provide an experience or are you trying to provide for us like our honest thing is we're like i lived overseas and i was around like little girls who needed wheelchairs or people who needed hearing aids or this kind of thing and, and it was just like it's just insane that the, the funding wasn't available even though there was all these like monster charities headquartered in, in malawi there's like all these suffering people around them and it was just like that was the status quo so no one questioned it so but anyways my when i focus on the Who's who? Which side of the marketplace am I focusing on? I'm focusing on the the people who need funding, the people who want to provide the the aid workers who are living overseas who want to provide the wheelchair, the hearing aid, and then the donors are almost like they're almost like the product. The the more donors we bring onto the into the system, the more we're able to help these people who are trying to fundraise for the people around them. Wow! So the donors are like the product, and then your customers are. The people who need the money. Somewhat, yeah. I mean, like, and obviously the donors, the reason the donors are there is because they're getting an awesome experience. But I, it's the same thing. It's the same thing with like YouTube. YouTube, in my opinion, and, and I, there's different ways people think about this, but in my opinion, the, the real people, the real customers of YouTube are the ones creating content on YouTube. Those are the reasons, because the people who create content bring reason for the viewers of the content to come and watch it. So like I think when especially when YouTube there there were it's hard to imagine now but there were like hundreds of video platforms when YouTube was just getting started out and YouTube won and that was because YouTube won because they they focused relentlessly on providing the best experience for the people for the content creators not for the viewers but for the content creators so it's, I think it's important to recognize who is it which side of the marketplace are you are you really trying to do and every, all of them do it Uber does it Airbnb does it eBay does it, all of them do it so it, it's really important to, to isolate it is definitely. That's why it's fascinating to hear your take on it because you're obviously doing it correctly. And I believe, and I fully agree with your assessment of YouTube in that sense as well. So yeah, five or so minutes ago, you said in passing, you said, the what was it? The science of scaling. You mentioned how just like growth is just kind of like, there's a science of scaling. And now you've talked about in the last nine months going from just literally like saying something to building a team, getting funding, and literally helping people around the world. This And this is scaling. This takes scale. This is, I would say that probably your first time where it's happening this rapidly. What is the science of scale you're talking about? And where are you sort of getting your guidance from? Yeah. So a lot of, that's a good question. When I look at scale, so the basic idea is that DonorC is a different platform today than it will be when it's three times this size or 10 times this size or a hundred times its size right now. I mean, we're, we're, we're seven months old. We're doing very, very well for a startup that's as new as, as we are, but we're also like going to be a completely different product at some point in the future, not completely different, but the way that we handle 
all of the, the traffic is going to be very different. So, for example, when we first launched DonorSea, we actually didn't even have a search bar because there weren't enough projects on the website. There wasn't an, enough tra traffic to justify it. And the search bar is something that costs money. The tech team has, you have to pay the tech team a certain number of hours to execute on that. And there were other things that were more important. So you have to look at, okay, what, what is the next, like, what do I have to build for the next one to three months? What do I have to prepare for at some point in the future? And you want to make sure you're not, the, obviously you, you can make mistakes where you just like, you, you basically are, are tying your hands behind your back because you're, you build something today in a way that, that will just break at, at when, it, when you're at 100X. Obviously you don't want to do something like that. We also don't want to waste time building things that you won't need when there are other more pressing things. So the science of scaling is always is focusing on those urgent, like what are those the most necessary things, right? There's a hundred different features I could build for donor seed right now. I could I could go to my tech team and give them a list of a hundred things that would be great to add to the platform. But my job as a CEO is to look at those that list of one hundred things and not do ninety nine of them and pick out that one thing. What's the one thing we have to do right now? So I would say that the science of scaling is really like knowing what not to focus on, what not to waste time on. Wow, that's awesome. So you as the CEO, you have a hundred things that you could add to the platform. You have to get rid of 99 and choose the one. What process would you go through, Grant? Like, is it a written process that you have at this point or just like an internal gut process to decide that that one thing is what you and your team should dedicate their time and energy to? Okay, so that's even there, even what that question, there's there's a scaling aspect to it. So initially, it was just like an internal gut process, and that's like that was appropriate when we were really small. But as we've had more things added to this list, I've I've had to create a spreadsheet where I kind of assess what are the most important things right now. Is the most important thing user acquisition, or is it once we've acquired users, is it conversion, or once we've converted users, is it evangelism where the users tell more people about? It? Like which which is the most important thing? And so I have a spreadsheet, and I kind of like. I prioritize things based on the scale of how easy it is and how how uh, complicated it is to execute, and then how big of an impact. And you kind of put all these different things into one into one spreadsheet, and it kind of it can it auto sorts everything for you. And you can say, okay, I like right now. I'm not saying this is the case for donorsy, but if you're you know an a tech entrepreneur, you're, you might say our biggest problem right now is we're not acquiring enough users. We're just not getting them. So like I need to forget about anything that has to do with conversion or anything that has to do with evangelism and just focus on acquisition. And when, when you can focus on that, then you can look at the 10 different things within acquisition that you could do to improve and you pick the highest impact one. Oh, well said. And if, are you going to not, so let's say like customer acquisition for donor C. Uh, it's going really well right now. There's this a viral aspect with the videos, with media kind of getting behind it, which could go really, really far for you. But you as the CEO, do you want to preemptively start thinking of other channels or do you want to put everything you have into that one and push it as far as it can without kind of being ready for it when it sort of drops off? Yeah, and that is, I made it sound like it was, it's a really easy thing to do is just throw everything into a spreadsheet and that kind of spits out the right information. It's really hard actually. And <laughs> like, I've made tons of mistakes. So yeah, I, Ultimately, the like decisiveness is important. You, you you do just have to like pick something and stick with it and do it and then see if it works and see if you were right. But sometimes you're going to be wrong and sometimes you're going to fail. And I've done that plenty of times. I've I've built things that probably were not smart to build at at that specific time and focus on acquisition when I should have been focusing on conversion or maybe I was focusing on the donors too much when I should have been focusing on the project posters that kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's tough. It's really hard and, and I've. I found I've gotten better as 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 I've gone along, but it's it's hard. Are you using mentors or coaches at this point? Yeah, I mean, I have a I have a host of different types of mentors or coaches. I'm I'm 27 years old, so I'm I'm a young guy, so I'm really dependent on people who have more experience than me. So, like, I have a guy who's knows a lot about growth hacking, which is where you build your business without spending marketing dollars. I know I have people who are just good at like basically human resources, like how do you manage a, a whole team of people. And that's like a that's kind of a new thing for me. I've kind of done it before. I have people who are really good in the in just like the the technical space. Like how do you like how do you pick the features to work on and iterate on it the right way? And how do you like a a big thing? I I've never coded in my life. I've never written a line of code. But like so, it'd be easy for a guy like me to get ripped off by a developer who just knows that I don't I don't know my stuff. So like having mentors in, in that capacity. Yeah, I, I have a whole a whole bunch of different people that I kind of like reach out to depending on, on what I'm working on. And so even going beyond sort of who your customers are in both sides of the marketplace, the way you are sort of 
using entrepreneurship and like the not for profit and donations and how you want to change that, which in this scope can go beyond your actual customers and bleed out to other places where other people can use sort of how you're melding the two. Like you aren't necessarily, you're a not for profit, but you're hundred percent. You're talking like an entrepreneur and like, this is a business. Yeah. We're at, we actually are a for profit. That oh. was a very intentional thing. Yeah. Wow. So homes, homes, the, the organization I started a few years ago that builds houses for orphans and widows, that was a nonprofit. And when I was trying to, dis, when I was, when I was looking at, I had, you know, I had the, the document, the Uber for charity in front of me. I'm, I'm trying to think, how can I execute on this the best? And the more I thought about it, the more it just like made all the sense in the world to make this a for-profit endeavor. It just, to me, my goal has been and always will be, I just want to help poor people. I want to help millions of people living in extreme poverty. That's what I want to do with my life. And if donor C, for whatever reason, crashes and burns tonight, tomorrow morning, I'll wake up and I'll think, like, how can I, what can I do to help poor people next? Like, what's the next thing for, like, how am I going to do that next? It's just like what my life calling is. So when I was looking at the, like, the, how I structure donor C, I thought, you know, I could make this a nonprofit. I could do the route that literally every other person in my situation would do. But what if I did for profit? What would that look like? And I, the more I looked into it, the more I'm like, man, this makes so much sense. One, I can get funding. So I actually have like a high tech product that people actually enjoy using. Whereas most nonprofit websites are just like a pain and like it's hard to fill out your credit card information. And people don't enjoy the experience whatsoever. So every, like, yeah, every, every part of this has been what's in the best interest of, of the people I'm helping overseas. And for, for this particular thing, making donors see a for profit seemed to make all the sense in the world. Wow. And I, I apologize for just making the assumption that it was not for profit. That's what everyone does. Yeah. <laughs> Which, <laughs> no but it's problem. still, I mean, you're in that space, but you're using business and sort of its efficiencies and the way it can scale to help more people and to have that greater ROI, like you were talking about at the beginning. Yeah. I like telling people I'm trying to do charity the Silicon Valley way. Like I want, I want Silicon, I want the, the optimization that Silicon Valley offers and the innovativeness that they offer to be a part of charity now. And, and it hasn't been in, the, the nonprofit sector, the charity sector has always been 10 or 15 years behind the high tech sector. And I want to bring them, bring them both together. Doing charity, the Silicon Valley way. Wow. It's a, it's a good, it's a good line. Good sound bite, huh? <laughs> exactly. You're good at them. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Grant. Well, you've come a long ways in the past year with Donor C and I can't wait to see where you take it from here. But let's say, I don't know what you set sort of your goals up because you're growing so rapidly and it's going to look different at 10x and at 100x. But where would you love to see donor C in, say, six months or a year from now? Six months to a year from now. That's interesting. I think that we're like right now we're still in we're still using our runway, our our venture our venture capital money that we initially got, and we're actually in the process of raising the second round right now. But six months to a year, I would definitely like to be in the black, no more like fundraising for money. Like we just have like the resources and the revenue to take care of all of that. And then that's that's just like a behind the scenes business kind of thing I'm hoping to see. I think on on the six months to a year might be a little soon for this, but I would say like three to five years. I would really like Donor C to just be like household name. Like everyone knows Donor C. This they know that it's the best place to give. They know that if you help, you you can spend five dollars on the site, buy a little kid in Thailand the shoes for Christmas, and you'll get a, a video of him opening his shoes on Christmas morning. You know that kind of thing. I want I want everyone to have have this experience. Um, I just think everyone, like when I say everyone, I mean like first world people. I want first world people to have the experience of seeing like their small amount of money making a big impact in the lives of people around the world. And then to bring it back to six months to a year, I, I think there's a handful of, our, you know, our, our current infrastructure is going to have to change with if we keep growing at the rate that we're growing. So some of that is, is another important thing that I'm working on. Very good. So donor C is D-O-N-O-R-S-E-E dot com. I will link mm -hmm. to it in the show notes for you as well as Greg Glyer's personal website. I'll try and find the link to that Tom Wood show you did that got this whole thing kind of started for you. Yeah. And then I'll track you down on Twitter. But right now you gave a pretty good pitch right there, but could you just give the listener, tell them if they're the right person who should be going to look to donate with Donor C? Yeah, so I'll put it this way. People have no, there's, there's a good chance that if you're listening to this, that you've been born into this like insane amount of wealth and you might not feel like a wealthy person. You might even be an entrepreneur who's like crunching every penny or whatever. I'm guessing a lot of your listeners are like that. But the reality is if you make, here's like the, just like by the numbers, right? I, I, I can talk emotion, but I'm, I guess I'm guessing your listeners like to hear about numbers, right? So if you make $34,000 a year, 
you're in the global 1%. That means you have more wealth, you have more income than 99% of the 7 billion people living on the planet. And if you make, it's something like 650 bucks a year, that puts you in the global 50%. That means if you make like $650, you're richer than three and a half billion people. So the that $34,000, there's not like this straight line down to the bottom of, of income earners on the States. It's like a, it's an exponential decline. So you're in a very awesome position. You've been very blessed in your life. And I would love it if you considered using donor tea, even if you just donate like a dollar, I don't care what you do, just donate a dollar, sign up to give 10 bucks a month, whatever it is that you want to do and see like how, not only how blessed you are, but like how much you can make an impact in other people's lives. And, and you'll actually get to see it with video. That's the thing about donors. You actually get raw video updates on how your money's being spent, even if you only give a buck. So go download the donors app and check it out and see for the first time what it's like to be in the position you're in and what you're able to do when for these people on the other side of the world. I mean, you're, you're, it's like Superman. You're like helping these people in ways you're giving sight to the blind. You're giving uh, hearing to the deaf. You're giving legs to those people who are parallel. You know, it goes on and on. So just think about, just think about donating a dollar. I love it. I love it. And I, I like how you pitch the economics of it rather than the emotion, but the emotion is, is there. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's no way <laughs> yes. to get around it. Gret. Yes. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, very well done. Well, Gret, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you so much for sharing so openly with me. I really, truly do appreciate it. And please, man, just keep doing what you're doing because it is very, very, very awesome. Absolutely. I will. Thank you so much for having me, John. My pleasure. I've now been using Active Campaign for four months, four f- almost entire months within my business. And it is my favorite tool to use in my business. It's simple, it's easy to use, and it's super effective the way it listens, learns, and adapts to how my subscribers act, open, read, listen, click through, all those things. It's, it's a fascinating email marketing tool that I think you should try. If you want to see why thousands are upgrading to a more intelligent marketing solution, you can get a 14-day free trial right now without even using a credit card. Go to activecampaign.com slash hack. Not only that, for being a Hack the Entrepreneur listener, I've got you a special deal. Free migration. So if you have an email list or email lists and templates and all that stuff over at another email provider, don't worry about it. We're going to move you over to Active Campaign absolutely for free. Plus, whatever service level you choose after your 14-day trial, you're going to get your second month absolutely free. Plus, this is cool. A free one-on-one strategy session with a platform consultant. You can even use this during your free trial to sort out how this platform works and see how to utilize it in your business. Start marketing smarter today. Go to activecampaign.com slash hack and get started with your free trial. Thank you so much, Gret. That was a lot of fun to have you on the show. We discussed a lot of different topics and really sort of got to get a glimpse into Gret's sort of insight into, I guess, how charity works and and how he wants to, he has this giant vision, right? To literally change the way charity works and to help the world's poorest people. And he's doing it through entrepreneurship. So being part of this conversation was, was really interesting, was unique, and was enlightening for me. But I'm really looking forward to this part, this part of the show now where I get to go back And I get to listen to the conversation the way you get to listen to it. So that's what I did. I went back and I listened to the conversation between myself and Gret. And then I went back and I listened to the conversation one more time. That second time back through the conversation, there was something that Gret had said that I had missed the first two times. I don't know how, but I did. But when I heard it this last time, what Gret said was so very, very clear. It was the one thing. Did you get it? Did you hear it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. It it started off not as a huge idea. When the first time it popped into my head, I was on the phone with someone and I was living in, literally living in in Africa. And I was, and they asked me like, what, what, you know, Greg, what are some of your dreams? What would you love to do someday? And I said, I would love to start the Uber for charity. And I just said that off the cuff. I don't even know where I came from. So at the time, you know, it was like the Uber for charity is like this nice bite-sized sentence. Who knows what it even means? I just said it. 
I got off the phone later. I when I typed up a little one page thing, and then it was then it turned into a one page thing, and then later it turned into a business plan, and then later we got funding, and later and so forth and so on. And so when when I first had the idea, it was a very small thing, and it's actually morphed and developed over time. And, and that's the hack. Gret, Gret, Gret. I love this. I love I love where this. I love where the idea for Donor C came from because it, it's such a has the potential to be something so life changing for so many people on both sides of the equation and the simplicity of how the idea came. So that's the one part of why I like this. Like the idea came just to him. He said, "I want to create the Uber for charity." All right, sounds good. And then he just kind of let it sit there, but then it turned into a one pager, just sort of write out the idea, kind of develop it a little bit, then turn it into like a business plan, launch a product and get funding. It's, I, I love that evolution. That's, that's how it works, right? But the key here, the key that I really want to emphasize is how many of us have that idea where somebody asks us what we want to do and we say, we want to create the Uber for blah, 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 blah. And then we don't do anything. Either because we think that maybe we need funding, but remember, Gret mentioned he got funding, but it was like three or four or five steps away from the idea. And just those incremental steps, slowly stepping up, developing out the idea, making it a reality, you don't go from just the Uber of this to funding. It goes in this natural progression, but it's all about taking the action. Believing in yourself enough and in your idea enough that it's worth taking action on. Gret absolutely did this. And I love how later, later, far in this conversation, he actually mentions how, and if this doesn't work out exactly, I'll just do another idea that builds off of helping the world's poorest people. Because that's what his goal is. That is what he wants to achieve at this point. But it all starts from just saying the idea and then slowly developing it, the one pager to the business idea to execution. That's what it takes. Gret, thank you so very, very much. If you want help right now taking action, I wrote a book just for you. And if you go to hacktheentrepreneur.com right now, put in your email address at the top, I'll give you a PDF copy of it absolutely free. Over 10,000 people have bought it. You can get it absolutely for free. Check it out, hacktheentrepreneur.com. It's just for you. Plus, I'm going to put Gret's show notes up over there. So you'll have links to gretglier.com, Donor C. I'll find that Tom Woods show as well as Gret's social media handles and links for you. All right, it's been fun. Um, that was a really cool conversation that I, I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. And I hope that you sort of reach out and track down Donor C, see what they're doing. And if you do have $5 or $10 a month that you want to donate to help change someone's life, life then Donor C, I think, is a great way to do that. Go check it out. Spread it around if you can, because Gret's doing amazing work. And any sort of word of mouth they can get helps. All right. It's been fun. Thank you so much for taking the time to stop by. I really, truly do appreciate it. And please, until next time, keep hacking the entrepreneur.